Thank you. Here are my claims. Firstly, um, Thorstein's uh, first adventure in the Thotter is based upon a 13th century legend of an elf queen, um, otherwise not attested until the 19th century. And uh, I argue also that this is an example that uh, it's possible, sometimes possible, to reconstruct elements of um, a medieval popular tradition from post-medieval uh, material. And thirdly, I argue that the 19th century legend uh, seems to be a key to the Thotter and to how the author worked with this material. And here's an overview of the uh, paper. I will uh, present to you um, the plot of the Thotter, a superficial interpretation of the Thotter, uh, material, um, that is believed to derive from, from myths reused in the Thotter. Um, known examples of that, and also less known or unknown examples of that. Um, that's the Elf Queen legend part. And finally, I will present um, a suggestion for a deeper interpretation of the Thotter and uh, some thoughts on how the author uh, used his material. So here's the plot. Um, Thorsten is missionary king uh, Olaver's uh, retainer and he makes uh, Austerweger journeys deeper and deeper into um, non-human lands to the elves, to the dwarves, to the giants beyond Fogs at Sea and then to more giants, uh, also beyond uh, Deadly River, even further away, and then finally to a grave mound um, of a living dead giant beyond the Fox at Sea and the Deadly River. Um, and after each journey, um, the uh, hero returns to the king um, with the treasures that he obtained. And uh, there's an essential uh, conversion or missionary motive. Because in the beginning, um, the, the Christian hero is in Christian Norway at the, the missionary king's court. Uh, but in the end, um, he conquers the most pagan um, country, kills its ruler, settles at his mansion, and converts and marries his daughter. Then he locks up um, the living dead ruler in his grave, um, the grave mound at this very mansion, uh, with a cross over the door inside the mound. So, an essential conversion motive, but on a closer um, exam um, inspection, this missionary motive seems more like an excuse for the author to compose a story in which the hero can go on adventures and prove his superhero abilities against dangerous opponents. Um, and technically, the function of the Christian motives is uh, mostly to structure uh, and tie together the narrative. Because the missionary king is the immovable point to which the uh, hero returns um, after each adventure. Now let's turn to the reuse of material. As is well known, the author um, has reused and shaped in his own way motives from myths, and especially Thor myths. And firstly, there's the myth of Thor's hammer and um, uh, his journey to uh, the giant Geirröder and the throwing of lightning or some glowing iron rod at uh, Geirröder's uh, place, uh, described in Thor's Drapa. In the Thotr, there is a deadly contest um, of throwing a glowing seal's head back and forth in, in the giant's uh, hall, just for fun, of course. And um, there's uh, the killing uh, of um, 
of uh, the giant king in his hall with a magical marble that can flash sparks and flash fire and will always hit when thrown and um, will always return to its owner after the throw. So it's very uh, similar to, to um, um, Thor's hammer. And it's also obtained from a, a, a dwarf like uh, Thor's hammer. Yeah, that was that. And um, finally, there's a, uh, a crossing of an abnormal, deadly, cold river on the way to this place where the throwing contest uh, goes on. And there is also other less known um, reuse of mythic um, motifs. We have here um, Thor's journey to Utgarda Loki. Uh, during that journey, Thor sleeps under an oak tree in the wilderness during the journey. In uh, Thorstein's Thotr, Thorstein sleeps in an oak tree in the wilderness uh, on his way um, to, to the giant. And there's also another scene uh, based on Thor's fording um, of the river Vimur um, on way to Geirröder and the ford, uh, Thor's fording of the Eli Vogar, uh, carrying the giant Aurvandil um, on his back. One of Aurvandil's toes um, is not covered inside uh, Thor's uh, rucksack, so it's frozen and has to be amputated. Now in the Thotr, Thorsten is carried across um, the magically cold river. Uh, one of his toes gets wet and has to be amputated. As we can see, it's mostly Thor myth myths that the author reuses. He clearly wants to connect Thorstein with Thor, and this can also be seen in his name, Thorstein. Um, the reason for this could be, I don't know, it could be that um, Thor fought giants just like Thorstein does. But there's also an Odin myth um, that seems to be um, reused in the Thor. We have the story of, uh, of um, the, the head of Mimr. It's a talking head owned by Odin and who gives Odin hidden information. And it is connected to the magical mead and, and the process that led to, to the, the magical mead. Now in the Thotr, we have um, the giant king has a, a magical drinking horn called Grimr, Grimr Mimr called Grimr with a head on it, you know, a talking head uh, that gives hidden information. And um, this horn is enormous, uh, but the giant king demands from his uh, guests that they be able to empty in one drink this enormous horn, or um, at the maximum three drinks which may be a twist on, uh, on the drinking contest at Utgarda Lokis. There's also a wrestling game in, in both places. All these reused uh, motifs are known from medieval manuscripts. In addition, the journey to Heimrin Nidri in the first part of Thorstein's Tater um, closely resembles an elf queen legend recorded by Jon Arnason in the 1840s. In both the Thotr and the legend, um, there's a hero who sneaks along with uh, a person on a supernatural journey. Uh, to Heimrin Nedri in the Thotr and to Nedri Begdir or Underheimar in the legend. Uh, which is the world of elves. And um, to go there, uh, they pass down through water, but the water uh, passage it's, it, it is like passing through fog or steam. 
And uh, the means of transport um, through the water come in pairs. There's two magical staffs, two pieces of cloth, two furs, and so on. Um, there's a gondred witch ride to uh, the watery passage. And uh, there's a feast at the court in the underworld. And the hero manages to take um, the queen's or the king's arm ring uh, and some of the food and bring back with him. And there are magical gloves used for the journey and um, they return through the same passage. So as you can see, uh, the resemblance is very strong. In some of the cases that I just uh, mentioned, um, like the Grimer talking head drinking horn, um, the resemblance could be accidental. But in this case, um, it seems very hard to, uh, to think that uh, it's accidental because it's a whole sequence of very specific motives in the same order. So uh, it's very hard not to think that there is a connection. That connection could be uh, that uh, the legend derives from uh, the Thotr, of course, that's possible, uh, but it's very unlikely. A far more likely explanation is uh, that um, a version of the Elf, Elf Queen legend existed in the 13th century and that the author uh, of the Thotr reused this legend in the Thotr. I will now give you the uh, reasons why this is what I believe. And here's an overview. Firstly, the legend version is logically and narratologically coherent. The Thotter version is not. Secondly, the Thotter version um, can easily be derived from uh, the legend. The opposite is difficult. And finally, the Thotter's um, deviances from the legend can easily be explained as changes made to make the story fit into a Fornaldar saga. Well, it's called Thorstein's Thotter, but really it is um, uh, for another saga, just that it's so short that it's called uh, a Thotter. In the legend, the journey to Ulfheimar is very well motivated. In the Thotter, the journey is weakly motivated. In the, in the legend, um, it is a woman employed at um, a farm who goes to Alfheimer at Christmas night and a boy working at the same farm who follows her. When they come uh, to uh, the Alfheimer, it turns out that the woman is the queen of elves and she sits um, in the high seat during uh, the feast and the boy steals uh, the objects to use them as proof the next day. Uh, proof that he followed the woman to the Alfheimer and that he observed her there. Then when uh, the boy confronts uh, the woman uh, the next day, she thanks him because uh, she had been cursed uh, to stay in the world of, of men except for Christmas night. Then she could go uh, home to her own, uh, her own people. But the curse would be lifted um, when a human man followed her to the, the Alfheimer. So as you can see, the journey in the legend has an important purpose. And the boy in the legend um, also has an understandable reason to, uh, to follow the woman. Everyone else goes to church um, at the Christmas night, except for this woman who volunteers to stay at home on the farm every year. And the boy is, is curious about what she does uh, when everybody is away. So um, he, he um, hides and, and spies on her. So um, the journey is very well motivated in, in the Thotr, uh, in, sorry, in the legend, but in the Thotr, uh, the journey to the underworld seems to be a random idea just for fun. 
and that's both uh, for for uh, the boy uh, who goes ahead and and for the hero who who sneaks along. In the legend, the stealing of objects from the queen in Alfheimer serves a crucial purpose. In the, uh, in the thought that the stealing is not strongly motivated. As we've seen um, in the legend, the objects are needed as proof. Uh, in the Thotter, they are um, only given to, uh, to King Olaver and serve no fur further purpose. But the Thotter version makes sense as uh, an adaptation of the legend to uh, the Fallen Other Saga genre. The hero is supposed to bring back treasures to his king. In the legend, the boy manages to remain unnoticed uh, through the whole journey to Alfheimar. In the Thotter, Thorstein is invisible at the elf court, but when he takes the objects from the king's table, he suddenly becomes visible. This change uh, contradicts the um, logic of the narrative, so uh, we should deserve, uh, so it, it should deserve an explanation, but it's not even commented on uh, in the Thotter. Uh, on the other hand, it can easily be explained as an adaptation to the Fallen Other Saga uh, genre. Because had Thorstein remained invisible, he would not have had the chance to make a dramatic and heroic escape. Which he should, as a hero. In the Thorstein, Thorstein sneaks along with the boy and they never talk. But still, the boy knows everything about Thorstein afterwards. And in the legend, um, yeah, the boy can go to the Alfheimar because he follows a woman who belongs there. So quite, it's quite simple and, and, and logical. Whereas in the Thotter, Thorstein can go to the world of elves because he follows a boy who doesn't belong in the world of elves, um, but who still has elf characteristics, uh, most clearly in the fact that he lives in a mound uh, in this world. It's tempting to think that the legend version was changed um, in the Thotter to fit into a Fornaldar saga. Because in the Fornaldar saga, the hero would need a brother in arm. That's typical in, in the Fornaldar saga. Two young men fighting together. So, um, therefore the woman was changed into a boy, but still he had to be an elf to be able to go to, to the world of elves. Uh, so therefore the elf mound in this world was invented. In short, the thought version makes much better sense as an adaptation of the legend. So it seems that the author of Thorstein's Thotter Bergermans not only used uh, myths that we know from medieval manuscripts, it seems that he also um, used oral material that we otherwise only know from 19th century collections, namely the Elf Queen legend. Then, uh, finally, um, the attempt at a deeper interpretation of the Thotter and um, my ideas about how the author used his material. Firstly, Thorstein, um, in the changed uh, motives, is given a more active role. Um, Thor uh, amputates Aurvandil's toe, uh, but Thorstein amputates his toe himself. And in the legend, the boy remains undercover in the Alfheimar, whereas Thorstein fights his way back. Loki wins the hammer uh, Mjolnir um, in a bet. Whereas Thorstein is given the Mjolnir-like marble as a reward for a heroic deed. Nobody outsmarts uh, Mimir's head, but Thorstein outsmarts uh, Grimr, the, the drinking horn, uh, drinking horn head. And Thor and his companions are ridiculed with Skrymir and Utgarda Loki at, uh, at the giant's court. 
Uh, but, but at the giant's court, uh, Thorstein turns the table in a similar situation. So Thorstein more active. Secondly, Thorstein is made invisible at the giant's court. The key to Thorstein's success uh, is the marble that makes him uh, invisible when grasping it. When using, yeah, he has this, this marble with the sparks, and when he grasps that, he's invisible. So that, and that's the key to his success at, at uh, the giant's court. Um, then in the wilderness, when using the oak tree uh, overnight, uh, Thorstein climbs into the tree, uh, which enables him to, to see without being seen. And thirdly, Thorstein is paradoxically given the role of the unlikely superhero. Now this is a double paradox. Thorstein is the biggest and strongest of all um, Norwegians back home in Norway. He's the strongest and biggest. But when it comes to the giants, uh, even his friends among the giants laugh at him because he's uh, no bigger than a child. But he, uh, Thorstein, is the one uh, who saves them, despite his modest appearance among them. He saves them because of his strength and smartness. So, the unlikely uh, hero. This motive seems to be partly inspired by Thor's visit to Geirröder, because in that case, uh, Thor is the underdog because he left his hammer at home, uh, according to Snorri. But this scene reminds me even more of um, Thor and his companions at Utgardalokis, um, because Utgardaloki and his men refer to Thor and his companions as children. And because of the magical deceptions, they actually do know better than children in the games at Utgardalokis. This situation seems to be very important to the author's idea of the Thotr, because Thorstein's by name Bøyarmagn seems to be inspired by uh, Thor's visit to Utgardaloki. Um, his by name is Bøyarmagn, which translates as mansion might. Uh, and according to the Thotr, uh, this was because he was, uh, Thorstein was so big that he could barely pass through an uh, ordinary door, even if it was open. <coughs> Don't you agree that this is a strange by name? Well, it makes sense if we see it on the background of Thor's visit to Utgardaloki. Normally, Thor and his companions would uh, not have been able to get into Utgardaloki's place, uh, because there's a wall around it, <coughs> sorry, wall around it, and a gate in the wall, and the gate is closed, and there's nobody there to let them in. But Thor and his companions are so small that they can just creep between the bars in the gate and get inside. And to me, it seems that the Bainem um is a del deliberate contrast to, to this situation. He's so big, he can't get through a door, as opposed to Thor and his companion, so small that, that they can creep between the bars in, in the gate. <coughs> and even so, even if um, Thorsten is, is uh, so small, his defe he defeats his giant uh, opponents. So that's the, the paradox. But how can, how can he do that? How can he defeat his uh, giant opponents? because he is invisible. He's invisible. And that situation is very similar to that of um, Thor at Utgardalokis. Uh, but Thorstein's companions with the games, um, yeah, sorry, but it's in the Thotr, a similar situation um, <coughs> with similar games as with Utgardalokis. But in this case, the good guys win the games and why do the good guys win the games? Because they have an invisible additional member of the team. First then is there to help them and he's invisible. And that decides the, the outcome. 
Now, where did the author get the idea of this invis invisible additional team member from? Well, I believe from the Elf Queen legend. Because there, uh, the boy that sneaks along uh, to, to, the, uh, to uh, the old Hamlet party, that boy has a similar role. The, the elves are not aware of his presence uh, at the court of East, and therefore he's able to manipulate the situation. And that has, seems to have been uh, transferred to, to um, a situation similar to, to the Utgardaloki uh, feast, uh, just the other way around. So, to sum up Sosjans Tautur, the point of gravity is the feast at the king's uh, court with deadly games between Thorstein, uh, Thorstein's giant friends and the king's men. This situation is inspired by Thor at Geirröder's uh, place and Thor at, uh, and his companions at Utkadalokis. With the invisible boy uh, hero from the Elf Queen legend added to enable the good guys to win. This seems to be uh, the essential idea of uh, Thorstein's thought. To create a story in which uh, the tables can be turned in the Utgarda Loki story in a paradoxical way. This time, deception is turned against the bad guys. And, and because of that, um, the hero succeeds in spite of his paradoxically modest appearance. The key to this understanding of the Thotter is the Elf Queen legend recorded in, recorded in the 19th century. So, when attempting to understand Old Norse literature, the popular traditions um, recorded in later times may be useful, as this audience knows. Thank you. <laughs>